Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. We are glad that you are here this morning. Um, it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord to worship. And Psalms 118, 24 says, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. As we rejoice this morning, we got lots to celebrate. So we're going to hear some uh, uh, baptism testimonies. We're going to see some uh, people get baptized, as well as we're going to celebrate communion. And so as we do that today, let's come and let's stand and let's sing together now. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. Y'all can have a seat, church. Good morning, and welcome to Living Hope Bible Church. My name's Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we're excited on this first Sunday in April, week following Easter, uh, first Sunday of every month, we as a church family stop and together 
we celebrate and we remember communion. And it's so important that we do this. Now, I do want to encourage you, um, there's several passages in the Bible about not just what communion is and what it represents, but there's a lot in, in Scripture about our heart's position in, in how we approach the Lord's table, if you will. Uh, Paul writes about that. In, in the longest passage of Scripture that Paul writes concerning communion is to the church at Corinth, which was a church that had a lot of good and a lot of bad, a lot, a lot of crazy there. Um, and folks in this church, uh, while they had an idea in part of what communion was, they kind of struggled with some points. And, and Paul writes them um, in, in an encouraging fan, uh, uh, fashion, but also in a corrective fashion about our approach to this. And that's why we do it typically in the middle of our worship set, because we want, this is an act of worship. It's an act of worship that together, this reflects your personal belief in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's why communion, you don't have to be a part of our church, Living Hope, to take this, but you should be a part of the Big C Church, all the believers. This is for those who have put their faith in Jesus alone as Lord and Savior. So part of what, what Paul would write, it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he says, that is why you should examine yourself. I want to put a little pin right there and just stop for a second. Before you take the bread and before you drink the juice, you are instructed, I am instructed in Scripture to stop and look at myself, examine myself, examine my heart, examine my mind, examine my motives. Uh, Paul continues to say, he, he says, you should examine yourself before eating the bread or drinking the cup. He says, for if you eat the bread or drink the cup, without honoring the body of Christ. And that body of Christ, we're the body of Christ, but this also represents the body of Christ too. So we want to both honor Christ through this, but we're supposed to also honor the body of Christ, his believers together as well. He says here, without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So it's serious, it's somber. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. Verse 31, but, but if we would examine ourselves, he says, you don't have to worry about that happening to you if before you take this, you'll stop. And in the quietness of your own heart, you confess your sin. You, you, you recalibrate and reset in Jesus. Before I take this bread and before I eat this, uh, eat this bread and drink this juice, I, I just want to, in my own heart, I love you. And, 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 and just acknowledge that. He says, for if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. I'm going to go ahead and call up the deacons. If you would come forward, please, and prepare to pass out the elements. And that's what we want to do. Um, while they're passing out, and this is, this is very intentional, while they pass out the cups, and remember, the cup has... Uh, the bread on the bottom and it has the juice and the cup inside of that. Uh, we're going to have some music quietly playing. We want you to think. We want you to right now just stop. Examine yourself. If you have something in your heart that's unresolved, boy, confess it to Jesus. If Jesus puts somebody on your mind, a brother or a sister who you may need to go make things right with, man, use this as an opportunity today. As soon as the service is done, Go see that person. Go call that person. Go text that person. Reach out. But this, is, this is big stuff. This table here. This, Jesus didn't just bring us reconciliation with the Father. He also made reconciliation as, as human beings together possible through his redemptive work. Jesus is amazing. Amen? And we love him. And we want this morning to stop as a church family. So they'll pass the, after I pray, they'll pass the elements out. I'll come back after we're done with that, and we'll take them together, okay? Let's pray. Father, I, I, I do look forward to that first Sunday of the month to take communion with my brothers and sisters here. It is a wonderful thing. It's a celebratory thing, but there's an element of this that's somber as well, as we want to check our own hearts, check our own minds. Lord, we... Uh, you, you even told somebody, Jesus, 
who brought a gift to the, to the temple, you said, leave your gift and go make things right with your brother. How we, how, that vertical relationship with you is above uh, all else, but, but the horizontal relationship we have with each other, that's really big too, and you're clear about that. So I pray this morning that as you have made peace with us through your work on the cross, your body, your blood, Jesus, and you made, made it possible for us to have peace with you, You also made it possible for us to have peace with each other. So we love you this morning. Jesus, we celebrate you. We honor you. We worship you. We glorify you. I just want to say collectively one big thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Father's love for us, how vast, beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon that cross My sin is on his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking It calls out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me That it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom. Amen, indeed. How deep the Father's love, how deep the Son's love, how deep the Spirit's love. 
There is, yes, there's a focus on this of the second member of the Godhead, if you will, on, the, on our Lord Jesus Christ. But the entire Trinity, through that entire episode, was suffering as well. We see the Father's love poured out, the Father's wrath poured out on Jesus, who takes it all. The Spirit who sustains and breathes new life into Jesus and then us at our salvation. And this is all just a great reminder of our Lord and what it cost him. So Jesus said in that upper room, the night before he was crucified, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he told them, he said, eat, this represents this bread. This is my body, which will be given for you. Let's take the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. And then after they broke the bread and took the bread, Jesus passed the cup around. And he said, this cup, this wine, this represents my blood, which was shed for you. And they drank and together today. We as a church family, through this juice, remember Jesus and his blood shed for us. Let's take that together. Let's pray. Lord, every time, please, I'm asking you, every time we do this, would you just, just nudge us a little closer to you? Prone to wonder, Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. God, so we say, here's our hearts, take and seal them. Seal them for your courts above. And this is part of how you do that. This is such a, such a wonderful ordinance that you've given the church, this gift of communion. Bless the remainder of the service, we pray in your name. Amen. All right, speaking of gifts and speaking of ordinances this morning, not only do we have communion, but we also have a couple of baptisms this morning. We had some of the earlier service too. So Jason's going to come and uh, help us with that. Grab the right microphone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. So glad you're here. Yes, we are celebrating. We're living out the ordinances that Jesus gave the church, communion, and baptism. And uh, just, just as a reminder here at Living Hope, what we believe is that baptism is not a, a assurance of salvation, putting your faith in Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection, putting your faith in him is equals salvation. So that's what we believe here. However, baptism is a way that we can publicly declare who we have put our faith in, declare our faith in Christ Jesus. And I love how the Apostle Paul describes it in Scripture. He's like, when we, when we are baptized, we are identifying with Christ's death and his resurrection. So as we go down into the water, we are dying as Christ did. And we're dying really to our old self, our old way. And when we, when we rise, we are rising to new life. When we come out of the water, we are rising to new life, just like Jesus did in his resurrection. So that's, um, that's baptism. And we are going to celebrate two baptisms this morning. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite Glenn and Aurora up to the stage, please. And we're just going to hear from them real quick about why they want to be baptized. And I'll have you, guys, I'll have you stand over here. And, um, and then we'll, we'll put them in the water. Hey, Glenn. Hello. How you doing, buddy? Good. good to see you. Right on, up top. So tell us, Glenn, why do you want to be baptized today? I want to show that who I've put my faith in, Jesus. Amen. Simple as that. God bless you, bro. Excited for you. Hi, Aurora. No, you're a little nervous, but it's okay. I'm here for you. I got your back. So, Aurora, why would you like to be baptized today? I want people to know that how, I much, how much I love Jesus. That's right. Yes, you do. God bless you. Yeah, let's give her a hand. It takes a lot of guts getting up here and, and talking in front of the whole church. Don't I know it? So, uh, yeah, you guys are doing great, okay? So, follow me. We're going to continue to worship, and then we'll have you guys baptized. Okay. Yeah, let's continue, and let's uh, have you guys stand as we uh, join in singing together. But he brought me in of oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last. Has ransomed me. 
continue in our worship. Psalms 145, 1 through 4 says this, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great, great is the Lord, Lord and, and greatly, greatly to, to be praised, praised. and his, his greatness, greatness is unsearchable. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and, praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. Be 
to idols, I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Death is just the doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing and my song will be the same. Yes, and Lord, as we come to you this morning, we thank you. We thank you that you created, aided us to know and that you know us and that you love us. We are fully known and completely loved by you. Though we fail you, you have never turned your back on us. and You remain faithful forever. Lord, we praise you and we worship you now. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Glenn, come on down, my friend. <laughs> there you go. Wave at everyone. There's mom and dad in the front. <laughs> hey, mom. Hey, dad. You want a picture real quick? Dude. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go, Glenn. Glenn, yep. upon your declaration of your faith, in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. always tired. I don't understand this. Every time I ask a youth, how are you? Like, I'm tired. Like, really? You don't, you don't know what tired is yet. <laughs> Aurora, upon your declaration of your faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is my pleasure to now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That is so exciting. We love baptisms, and it should be a big, big deal when somebody gets baptized. And I hope as a church family, we never lose the uh, excitement and the passion we have for watching people follow Jesus. Amen? It's good stuff. All right, grab your Bibles. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. I got a couple of things and announcements to mention with you real quick, and then we're going to hop in here. Okay, a few things. If you're visiting or if you're new or if you've had a change in your information, phone number, address, email, whatever, uh, use that connect card that's in the front of uh, where you're sitting there in the back of the pew. Uh, especially if you're visiting, if you'd fill that out and then after church out there in the lobby, there's a, it's pretty obvious, it says guest central. If you just take that card there, they have a gift for you and uh, would like to just thank you for coming and being our guest and 
answer any questions that you might have. So fill that out for us. Uh, let's see, a month from today, we're going to assume and pray and hope that we have a little better weather. Uh, it's so predictable. Um, May 5th, cornhole and corn dogs. Look, yes, right? I love corn dogs. I just like food, you can tell. Um, but I know it's a little corny, but we... <laughs> Hey, people at the first service laughed at that, too. <laughs> Just for that, I'm going longer. Um, they, uh, uh, we, we just honestly, I, I am an adamant believer that God is pleased when his people, yes, it's great for us to worship and pray and get into the word, but God likes it when we play together. God likes it when his kids have fun. All you parents, don't you love when your kids get along and you're like, oh, for just a moment, it's like heaven on earth. And so we, we, we want to set the table and give opportunities for everybody to, to have a good time together. So on the 5th, we're going to buy like a thousand corn dogs. Not really a thousand, but we're going to buy a lot of corn dogs. We'll have some other healthy food like it. And uh, we're going to meet out back after this service. And hopefully not everybody comes to this service. I thought of that. I was like, I hope that doesn't. Still come to nine if you're a nine o'clock person. But anyways, we're going to meet out back, and we're going to have uh, food and just fellowship. We want kids out there playing, all that kind of stuff. Um, we'll have a tournament for those who are competitive, and uh, you'll need to pick a partner and get that, and get, let us know who that's going to be. And then we'll have a bunch of boards just set up for people to recreationally, you know, throw, uh, throw the bags and that kind of stuff. But we're doing that on the 5th. If you have a good cornhole set, because we need probably 20 or 30 sets for that day, if you've got a cornhole set we can use, uh, please bring it and put it in Jason's office, okay? So <laughs> he'll take good care of it, and you may get it back. So, but we do, seriously, we do need help with uh, getting the, the cornhole boards and sets on that day. We'll, we'll send out the info on that. All right, anyhow, we have man camp coming up at the uh, middle end of May on the 17th to the 19th up in McCall. Uh, we really this year want to go all out for man camp. So young and old and middle, it, it, all the guys, you got to come to man camp this year. It's going to be steak, bacon, worship, not worshiping steak and bacon. We don't do that, but uh, we got a, we got a great guest speaker coming in for it. It's going to be a wonderful time of food and fellowship. Um, and it's, it's, I've been able to go to two of these so far, and they've just been wonderful. So I really hope you guys will come out. Uh, registration starts this week. And then uh, I want to mention, if you're new or new-ish to the church, uh, at the end of this month, we do, every couple of months, we do a little luncheon with our staff uh, for newcomers called Discover Living Hope. We kind of go over the 30,000-foot view of who we are as a church. We'll tell you what we believe. That's important. We'll tell you how we do church, introduce our staff and some of our leadership, our elders, that kind of stuff, ministry leads. It's just a chance for you to come and get a free Jersey Mike sub and, uh, and get to know us a little better and answer questions. So that'll be after church on the 28th. And then finally, I uh, just want to make you guys aware, we've got some offering boxes up on the inside here, at these corners, and then in the lobby, there's two boxes as well. Um, obviously, we have online. You can do it through the Church Center app. Lots of easy ways to give. We just want to make that convenient and as easy as possible for people. All right, let me pray. And then we're going to jump into Acts chapter 8. Lord, uh, thank you for this day. Oh, it's already just been so blessed to come and to worship you through song and to worship you through communion, to worship you through celebrating other people's obedience and baptism. And now we still worship you because we know that when we, when we dive into the Word and we, through the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, when we learn and we grow and we uh, know more of who you are, know of more who we are and what we're supposed to do, when we become uh, dis discipled, that's all an act of worship. So we continue. That's why this is a worship center and this is a worship service. Uh, there, there's so much to this life of worship in bringing you glory. So that's our heart this morning, Lord. I pray... God, I pray right now just for anybody who's here today with a heavy heart, I pray that they would, uh, before they leave this place, that they would leave that heavy load at your feet, Jesus. You said, give us your burdens. Give us our, you'll, you'll take our burdens, and your burden is light. So uh, teach us that today, Lord. We pray in, this, in your name. Amen. 
All right. Uh, have you ever seen, um, like, they got, there's movies out there where, like, the zombie apocalypse or there's some disease, and these movies, you know, they, they usually start off in a jungle, and there's somebody gets a disease or something happens, and then all of a sudden there's a lot of serious people at, like, a center for disease control or something, but they show a map, like a global map, and there's a red dot where the epicenter was, where ground zero is. And then they say, if this thing gets out or if these zombies, you know, eat more people, I don't know. But th- what it says is they show these maps and it shows it starting at that epicenter, ground zero, and then spreading from there. Well, in the New Testament church, I know, horrible analogy, but uh, <laughs> in the church, Jerusalem is kind of this ground zero. It is the, it's the beginning, it's the birthplace, it's the cradle of the gospel going out into all the world. Jesus had told his disciples, last thing he said before he took that cloud elevator up into the sky, he said, you're going to go out and you're going to take the gospel, Acts 1.8. You're going to take it to Jerusalem, you're going to take it to Judea, you're going to take it to Samaria, and you're going to take it to all the earth. And up until Acts 8... Up until this point, it's been phase one. Phase one has been Jerusalem. Now, had this persecution, which is about to come on the church, had this persecution not happened, I don't know how long it would have taken the gospel to get out of Jerusalem into Judea and especially up towards Samaria. We're going to talk today about what we sometimes, so much of Scripture, when we just read through it, not really thinking about the details and the names and the places. But we're going to take time today to focus on Samaria and why that is such a big deal today, that the gospel is going to go to Samaria. So beginning here in Acts chapter 8, we see phase 2. Phase 1 was Jerusalem, uh, the, the Jewish congregation there. And we know by this point, it's been about like three to five years. We don't have exact dates, but it's been roughly three to five years, the early church has grown into the tens of thousands, right? Imagine doing cornhole and corn dogs with that. Maybe a lot of corn dogs. Um, but the church has grown and grown and grown, and persecution now has reached its, its kind of its, its pinnacle. First, it started with a slap on the wrist. Hey, guys, don't do that. Don't go out and say Jesus' name anymore. They're like, okay, sure, whatever. So they go out, and they keep sharing the gospel, and then they get arrested, they say, hey, guys, stop doing that. Okay, well, we can't. We've got to obey God. So they keep doing it, and eventually they get arrested, and then they get beaten. And now at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen has preached the gospel, and he has been killed for preaching the gospel. He is the first martyr. And what we see is a very potentially scary moment for the church. Can you imagine if you're in the early church, and you're either there and you witness that, awful, or you're, you're a part of the church and you hear about it, right? That's going to put a little, when you get ready for church that next week, it's going to put a little fear in your chest. It's going to put a little doubt there. And the early church is about, the, the, the heat is really, the heat of persecution is really about to get uh, uh, turned up to, 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 to 10 here uh, from, from Saul before he becomes Paul. But what I want you to understand today is we see this, the, it's, it, Acts chapter 8, Phase two, the gospel now is going to grow in a number of ways. That's going to be our theme as we uh, talk through these 25 verses. So when we look at Acts chapter 8, the first three verses starts with this. Gospel persecution grows. Let's not sugarcoat these things and act like that's not a big deal. That's a huge deal. Uh, How many of you have been to the uh, Birds of Prey Center here in town? It, it took us a while. We always wanted to go. We went recently. I was like, this place is actually really cool. It was really neat. So we go to the Bird of Prey Center recently. We walk through the visitor center, and that first area there, that first exhibit is a, a peregrine falcon. And we happened to walk in there right as they were giving this bird a mouse. Have you ever seen what a bird with razor-sharp talons and a razor-sharp beak does to it? It's like, oh, it's like watch. Remember back when we were growing up, Wild America, you know? Oh, cool thing about nature, you know? (laughs) Is the mighty lion attacked his prey? Like, oh, can we turn on something else? And so this bird just tore this mouse apart. I mean, it's just kind of, you feel even weird watching it. But 
the word that we would use, that the Greeks would use to describe an animal eating its prey is the word here to describe how Saul persecutes the church. Do you, can you paint that picture? Okay, that's not them using hyperbole. That's how viciously Saul is going to attack the early church. So if we go ahead and get into our text here, verse 1, you'll see here it says, and Saul approved of Stephen's execution. We know that. So what happens is there arises on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they, the church and many of its leaders, they are dispersed, diaspora. They are scattered. And it's the same idea of of a sower scattering seeds. That's what's happening here. An evil incident, an evil act, God uses it as only God can do. He uses evil, even evil, for his ultimate purposes and glory and the good of people. Which some of you right now this morning, I know there's people in this room, right? You come in, you got a heavy heart, you, 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 got, you feel the evil of the world. Remember, God can use all those things. So it says here, they're scattered throughout the regions of Judea. Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, then Judea, and then Samaria. We're going to come back and talk about Samaria in a minute. But it says here, the only people that didn't go, it says, except the apostles. So the, the leaders of the church, they, they stayed back. Okay, the early pastors, if you will, the early leaders, the apostles, they stay, but the, the early deacons, they spread out. And many of the, especially the Hellenistic Jews, uh, which Philip is one of those, they, they, the, these Greek background Jews, they begin to scatter and spread. Now look what it says. It says, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Here it comes though. But Saul was ravaging. That's the word. That, that ravaging does not begin to do it justice. I mean, he was aggressively trying to cause as much pain as he could. He was ravaging the church. Look what he did. He didn't just get them at the temple or in their meetings. Where did he go? House to house, right? We've never had to worry about that on our door. They, at this point now, they go to church, they get seen with the Christians, they may get a on their door, and it might be Saul, right? That's the reality for them. That's the reality for a lot of believers today. We all are aware of that. We talk about that. But he goes house to house, and look at the level he goes to. He dragged off not just men, but women, okay? At that time, Paul of Saul really would have been, he's going after men and women in their homes. Not a fun time to put a Living Hope Bible church on the back of your chariot or your wagon, right? This, this, to be a Christian at this point could come at the risk of, they would go and they would take, the, 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 the secondary recordings we have in history of what they were doing to the early church is just painful. But we see here, persecution grows. I said a few weeks ago, I mentioned the quote from one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, and he said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church indeed. And Saul is just an intense, all-in guy. He is, he is, he's like full-on Hulk right now, right? You won't like me when I'm angry. He is rage monster towards the church. That's part of why that same hyper-intensity when Saul gets saved and becomes Paul, he didn't lose that. And now he had that fervor and that passion for the gospel. That's part of what's so exciting about his story and the arc of his life. But the gospel persecution begins in the first three verses. But as only God can do, verses 4 through 8, what do we see? God takes bad and he turns it into good. So what happens? Gospel opportunity grows. This is really good stuff right here, church. Gospel opportunity grows grows. Out of the darkness, God makes the light shine bright. Not only does the gospel opportunity grow, but folks, we're about to see a miracle where the gospel is going to go, both literally and figuratively. Let's go ahead and look at verse 4 real quick. Now, those who were scattered, they went about preaching the word. They, they, when they left and fled Jerusalem, they were, they were fleeing for their lives. But guess what they didn't stop doing? They didn't stop sharing the gospel. They went out, this early church, 
like five, they're, 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 they're just, it's, all these people go and they're spreading the gospel. I have a quote up here I want you to see. Evangelism, we talk about evangelism. Well, evangelism is a group of ordinary Christians living intentionally in their community or in their city to bring it joy through sharing the goodness and truth of the word, and that includes the gospel, the gospel is a part of that, and the grace and kindness of good works. And that's what we're going, that's exactly what Phil, our boy Philip here is going to do. I, I put in there, it's ordinary people, because God specializes in letting his mighty works uh, shine brightly through the most basic, ordinary I can even say humdrum, vanilla, whatever you want to call it, of people. This isn't, the, this isn't Peter. It's not John. It's not yet to be Saul. I mean, this is, this is Philip. He's one of the early, we call it, you know, he's an early deacon, if you will. Gospel movements through history and gospel ministry are done by common people. The gospel advances significantly here through what we as a church, what we do out there. That not primarily about what takes place in here. It's important for us to understand that the purpose of the church, right? The church by its nature is the gathering of believers. The church is not a collective gathering of believers and those who don't know Christ. So those who don't know Christ are welcome here. But the point of the church is for believers to worship Jesus who they know. Communion is for believers. Baptism is for believers. Preaching, right, is primarily for believers. doesn't mean we can't be evangelistic. Last Sunday, perfect example. We, we did a totally evangelistic sermon last week, right? But, but the church's job here is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We are to go out and we are to be like these early people here in verse 4. Four. That's what the, the we are supposed to do. Now, before we get into verse 5, I want to give you some important background on Samaria. If you are even have a cursory uh, level of familiarity with the Bible, you, you know, especially in, Ma- in, in the book of John, when Jesus, and he, he, Jesus does a short-term mission trip, you know that? Jesus took a team, his, his disciples, and they go to Samaria. And as soon as they go to Samaria, his guys are like, what are we doing? And if you, I don't know if you read that, you're like, what's the background of that? Matter of fact, when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, is she like, oh, hey, Jesus, nice to see you, high five. What does she say? She says, why are you talking to me? That is representative of the hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews. So if you know at all the history of Israel, Israel had, Israel had their first three kings. They had Saul, they had uh, David, and then they had Solomon, right? And that united kingdom, we call it the united kingdom because there's the 12 tribes of Israel, almost like 12 states or provinces, if you will. But those 12 tribes made up the nation of Israel. After Solomon dies, uh, the ten northern tribes rebel, and they essentially secede from the nation of Israel. They break away, and the ten northern tribes become their own nation under his other son. So he's got his two sons, one's over the south, one's over the north. And the ten northern tribes say, you know what? And they take the name Israel. They say, we're Israel. Israel. And we don't have that king, we have this king, Jeroboam, not Rehoboam. The two remaining southern tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, so they call themselves Judah now, and it's what we call the divided kingdom. You have the north and the south. Well, for 200 years, intermittently, north and the south, battle, battle, fight, fight, nobody really gains any ground. And eventually what happens is, in those 10 northern tribes, uh, there becomes a, a world power begins to rise just north of that in Assyria. And there's this guy, his name is Sargon. Doesn't that put, like, Sargon, it sounds even scary, like King Sargon. And Sargon uh, began to attack Israel, the ten northern tribes from the north. That took their focus off of Judah in the south, and they began to fight back. Well, Assyria is a strong world power. And eventually, they conquer the northern ten tribes. Now, 
what they end up doing is, and this is how, this is what they would do at that time. When they conquered a nation, they immediately took the men and the women and they had them marry people from other nationalities, basically to destroy the, the ethnicity, if you will, of that nation. And that's why the 10 tribes are considered the lost tribes, because they were, in a sense, they were bred out. And so that's the 10 northern tribes. So give it about another 100 years or so, a little 150 years, and the southern two tribes, Judah, they begin to be attacked by the new world power at that time, which is the Babylonian Empire. And in 586 B.C., uh, the Babylonians destroy the temple in Jerusalem, and they take the two Judah, the people from Judah, they take them captive. Okay, you see a lot of that in the, in the major prophets. And I'm really, really shorting this up here. All that to say, 70 years later, uh, Ezra comes back, and he begins to rebuild the temple. And then shortly after that, Nehemiah is allowed to come back, and he begins to rebuild the walls. Well, when they show up, the people in the 10 northern tribes and the people in the two southern tribes, they hadn't interacted in a long time. So when the Jews come back, there's this new neighbor to the north, no longer Jews, but Samaritans, and the Jews are immediately hostile towards them because up north of them, when part of when they had the people intermarry and all this kind of stuff, what they also did was they introduced outside religion in. So the Samaritans had this kind of weird hybrid Jewish, they had elements of, uh, of Judaism, but they also had a lot of elements of, of pagan things from Assyria and other nations. So the Jews were just immediately like, nope, they stiff-armed them, and they, they told the Samaritans, you, you, they said, you have no part in this, this is only for us. And, and unfortunately, that began a lot of really, really bad blood. That's why, that's why if you read the Gospels and you come across those things about Samaria, the Jews are just brutal to them, right? I mean, when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, people are like, Good Samaritan? That's an oxymoron, Jesus. There's no such thing. That's like saying the benevolent terrorist. I mean, you know, so people, when, when one of the times Jesus goes through Samaria, it says there that Jesus was, he was in a hurry to get back down to Jerusalem, and basically ministry didn't happen, and they were, so when they leave, James and John are like, Jesus, let's just call fire down from heaven and just destroy the whole place. Those guys now are about to go back up there, and we're about to see miracles happen. It's crazy. So all that to say, at this time, the most unlikely place on the planet Earth for the gospel to go was Samaria, okay? The Jews had always had their thing with the Gentiles, but boy, the Samaritans, that was a, just a whole nother level. And it's interesting because there was some, there was some bad blood here, very bad blood. Uh, the Samaritans had actually built their own temple. They had their own priesthood. They, they, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the high priests from Judah actually went up one time and destroyed the temple in Samaria. The Samaritans would sneak in at night, and they would put bones sometimes in the Jewish temples, which then made them unclean. Uh, I read on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> must be true. But I read one time that, that the Samaritans sometimes would fling dead pigs over into Israel, into, <laughs> into these areas, because no... You had, someone had to clean it up. And that meant if you had to clean it up, well, then you were unclean for a, a week and all kinds of things happening. All that to say, when Philip now, as we're going to see, show.